everyone. My name is Mallory Wood, and I am the Marketing Manager at M. Stoner. And I am so excited to welcome you to today's webinar, What Do I Say? Content Ideas for Your Social Media Channels. So I want to do a really quick audio check because I want to make sure that you can actually hear me. Um, so if a couple of people could please use the raise your hand feature. If the audio is coming through loud and clear, I would really appreciate it if you would hit that now so I can make sure. I'll just give you a second. Perfect. All right. So a few of you have raised your hand. I'm going to assume that everyone can actually hear me. Um, if for some reason there's audio issues during uh, the presentation, please use the chat feature or just hit me up on the back channel and I'll uh, make sure we address that immediately. So before we get started and before I introduce Susan, I just have three really quick housekeeping items. First of all, today's webinar is being recorded and so we're going to assume that technology is working for us and what we will do is post this webinar on our YouTube channel, on our blog, and on ED Universe next Friday, so a week from tomorrow. And the reason is, due to high demand of today's webinar, we are actually offering the same session again next Thursday at 1 p.m. Eastern. So if you have colleagues or friends who couldn't make it today or you think would benefit from this information, absolutely direct them to our blog because they can register for next Thursday. And then after that session wraps up, we're going to be posting the recording from today's session on uh, the YouTube channel blog in the universe. So second, the hashtag for today's webinar is SM Content Ideas. So I hope you'll join me in the back channel and we'll have conversations about what's going on. And you can absolutely use the chat feature or Twitter to ask questions during the webinar. So I'll be uh, pulling all of those questions together and we saved about 10 minutes at the end for the Q&A. If for some reason you ask a question and we don't get to it, Susan is going to follow up with an answer on the M. Stoner blog as soon as possible. So make sure you tweet your questions to the hashtag SMContentIdeas or to me at Mallory Wood. So without further ado, I would like to introduce today's presenter, Susan Evans. Susan joined the M. Stoner team as a senior strategist last September. And as a senior strategist, Susan helps institutions tell their story and print and on the web. Before I'm Stoner, Susan spent 20 plus years directing communications, marketing, and technology at the College of William & Mary. And I see on Twitter we have some of our William & Mary friends here with us, so a special shout out to those of you who are attending today. Susan's presented at regional and national conferences, including High Web, Tate, and the American Marketing Association Symposium. So during today's session, don't forget to tweet Susan at Susan T. Evans. So Susan, I'm going to turn the session over to you and let's get started with some content ideas for our social media channel. Thank you very much, Mallory. I appreciate the introduction. Hello, everybody. I've been really looking forward to talking with you, all of you about content ideas for social media channels, and I'm really glad you joined me for the webinar today. So since the focus of my presentation today is social media, I thought I'd give you some background about my own use of social. And actually, for me, the practice of social media has been a long time coming. In fact, I'm pretty sure my training ground for social media started back in 1969, which is the same year that Crosby, Stills, and Nash recorded this song. Now, this is not my fourth grade classroom in an elementary school in Egg Harbor Township, New Jersey but it looks a lot like the 69 classroom that I was in. And behind those folding doors there in the corner, you'll see the coat closet where these children would hang up their outerwear when they got to school every day. And for those of you who are listening to this uh, webinar who aren't as old as I am, coat closets came before 8-track tape. You're probably wondering where I'm going with all this, so here's the connection. It's true. I was a talkative kid, and when I was in the fourth grade, my teacher, Mrs. Truitt, said, Susan Talbert, I'd like to send you to the coat closet for talking, but if I did, you probably just talk to the coat, so I'm not going to bother. It's true, I've been social for a while, and I have teacher comments on my report card to prove it. So 37 years later, it was 2006, and I was working in IT at the College of William & Mary. 
I used social media for the very first time when I started this blog at William & Mary. I was leading a redesign of the William & Mary website, and we wanted to be transparent about what we were doing. So I wrote blog posts to chronicle the project. Check out the language on that first post. I did get better at blogging. So as I was reminiscing about my first blog post, I started thinking about the first time I used Twitter, and I wondered about my very first tweet. By the way, if you're ever supposed to be working on your slides for a webinar and you want to waste eight and a half minutes, scroll back through 2,456 tweets to get back to November 2007. So when I finally got to my first tweet, I admit I was a little disappointed but not as disappointed as I was when I saw my second tweet. Believe it or not, it took me 26 days to come up with that second one. The point is that, like you, I've added social media strategy to my professional bag of tricks, and over the last seven years, I've directed social media as a way of communicating and engaging with audiences. So enough background. My plan is to give you a lot of content ideas so that your social media properties are compelling and engaging and well done. There are a lot of things we could talk about today. We could talk about social strategy, we could talk about social media policy, social media campaigns, but instead we are going to have a singular focus, and that focus is content. I originally decided to do this presentation because if you're just getting started with social media, it's sometimes daunting to figure out what to say on a channel, especially a channel for your institution. And even those of us who've been doing social media for a while experience an occasional dry spell, or we have to suffer through some good old-fashioned writer's block. You can probably guess why I've included this slide. And although I won't be able to hear you, I hope that at least a few of you are going to say it out loud. Content is king. So the craziest things happen when you're preparing slides for a conference or a webinar presentation. As I was putting together this one, I happened upon a blog post by Mark Rothbaum of Varsity Outreach. According to Mark, content is king when you're building a website. But when it comes to social media, Mark says content is not king, engagement is king. Here's my response to that, excuse me? Frankly, I disagree with the idea that engagement is king. In my view, great content is what allows engagement to happen. In fact, I think great content is foundational. Without it, engagement on your social channels is just temporary and potentially superficial. I do, however, recommend Mark's blog post to you. There's a link here, and when we post the slides, you'll be able to, you'll be able to get to that. I especially like his idea that social channels should be like a seminar, not a lecture. We all know that social is, after all, about the conversation, but I think this bears repeating. So as we commit to great content today, let's all take a vow to have very high standards. Likes and retweets aren't enough, right? We want to post content that encourages our audiences to respond and to participate and to talk with us. Let's also vow to use the right tool for the right job. After all, social media has matured enough that we can now tell the difference between content that we should post on Twitter versus content that's right for Instagram or Pinterest. Perhaps you guys have seen this image uh, uh, that's on the slide now floating around the internet. Thanks to this humorous perspective, we are reminded that Facebook is where we say we like donuts, and Pinterest is where we post a donut recipe, and Google Plus is where Google employees are posting about eating donuts. So even if you agree that content is king, you still have to do the work of producing stuff for your social channels. So let's talk about the sources that can help you make content king on your own use of social media. So here's where we move into the stream of consciousness portion of this webinar. Essentially, you're about to get the written equivalent of my thought process. So come on the journey with me. Here's my best thinking on social content. Let's imagine that this webinar is really just you and me on a couple of couches, spitballing ideas about content. I've divided these into three rounds. 
Round, round one ideas are the obvious stuff. These will be a good refresher if you've been a social content strategist for a while and need some ideas. Or round one will be good if you're a newbie because it will offer a baseline for social content. Every year we recruit students, right? I think admission blogs are an exceptional way to connect with prospective students. There's varying kinds of content built in with student blogs because you have multiple students writing and providing an authentic voice about their own experience on your campus. I recommend that you take a look at the blogs on the Biola University site. Biola is a private school in Southern California, and these student blogs do an exceptional job of describing the brand of this Christian school and its mission. It's incredible that sometimes student bloggers without a script would say exactly the things that you would want them to say if you were providing a script about your own institution. Social content specific to your incoming class of students is also a good idea. Many, many schools are creating content to yield students. And by putting admit admitted students into a social platform like Facebook, you create an environment where content posted by their peers who are also trying to decide whether or not they want to come to your school, can influence the people you've admitted. This example comes from St. Michael's College in Vermont, and you'll note that a welcome page on the St. Mike's website on the left is partnered with a Facebook group for new students. I think you should exercise bragging rights and use social channels to talk about what people on your campus are doing, profile their experiences, if you just tell the story about the activities of your students and faculty, and your, mess your messages will come through loud and clear. Two things I'll note here. Think about your external audience. Some things that your students are involved in happen every year. And to your internal audience, it seems like repeat content to post again about the community service project that students do every year during orientation. But just remember, our external audiences change every year in higher ed as students graduate and new students arrive. And here's the second thing, and it's a bonus. Parents of current students love seeing this sort of content on social channels. Photos, I think, are an easy win in the social world. I don't think you can post too many of them. I really like Gettysburg College's Flickr set. They have put together a set of cover photos that they've used in Facebook. We also know that prospective students and alums like to see beauty shots. Prospective students are trying to get a sense of place. They're trying to figure out what your campus is like before they decide to make a visit. And alums are trying to remember their own time on campus. Take advantage of this kind of content for engaging lots of different types of visitors. This is, a, I think, an incredibly lovely aerial shot of the University of Virginia. Another idea for content on social channels is to tie back to your official web presence. You can use Twitter and other social channels to tee up a theme or a message and then link back to a web page on your EDU site. And by the way, those of you who know a little bit about search engine optimization also know that um, links that come from social channels increase your rankings in a lot of the search algorithms. So that's, a, that's another reason to, to use social channels in this way. And remember that people have to be reminded and invited to visit and to come back to your website. They have a lot of information that they're seeing on a lot of different platforms. And to keep yours front and center, sometimes you have to remind them. Many schools are doing what Tufts is doing. They're linking to news releases. And then linking to blog posts, like the student blogs that you see here from Ball State, are another great idea. Cool Spirit is another source for content. This is Drake University's Pinterest board. It's called Alumni at the Office. And it's very simple concept, just some photos of the bulldog items that Drake alumni have in their offices. So this is a really easy way to feature your mascot and reconnect with your alum. And another bonus, you might get some new photos to share on your other social channels. And speaking of athletics and school spirit, Anything related to athletics is good, is good content for social. This is a YouTube video from Ohio State, 
and it's you know it's always been interesting to me that if there's a huge win or an unexpected victory in an athletic event, there's a lot of social engagement. And even at a school where athletics is not a big part of the campus culture, I guess everybody likes to cheer about a winner. If you've got the capacity to produce it, video is super content for social. Um, this NYU example includes video clips of faculty experts. And these experts are commenting about research that they're, that they're doing. And they're connecting their research to topics that are of broad interest to the general public. So when you use tools like video or YouTube, you can also integrate that video content into your EDU pages. So again, video of all sorts is, is great content for social. And I think especially when we can feature video that explains the academic experience or explains the research and scholarship of our faculty members. So you're on a campus, right? Um, sometimes I think we lose sight of this. Um, where some of our content ideas can rely on the rhythm of the academic calendar. We pretty much know what's going to happen every year. Students are going to move in, alums are going to go to homecoming, and seniors are going to graduate, not to mention the many other things that happen on any given day on a campus. But you can take advantage of the, the academic calendar and plan for what's happening next. You can also take advantage of campus tradition as content for social. A tradition at Whittier College in California is Painting the Rock. And the YouTube channel there from Whittier that you see on the left is featuring a video of the college president doing the painting of the rock. I'd also suggest that you look around campus for some less typical events that you might want to promote. Here's an example from Webster University in St. Louis. Webster used Instagram to publish photos live from a real big fish concert that was held on campus. So here's a final idea as we're wrap, wrapping up this round one. If all else fails, talk about the weather. And I'm really not kidding on this one. Weather posts usually get a response, and they usually offer a good chance to post a photo, especially if the weather you're showing includes snow or spring flowers. All right, let's move on in my stream of consciousness to round two. And we're going to show a bit of swagger now. And we're going to proudly step into our social media role. And we're going to take a few chances with content. So links to news are great for social. And the best part is you get to break the story. There's no more hoping that a newspaper will run it. You are the publisher. With any luck, the media will pick up the good content from your social channels and publish it on their site. Social media is an ideal way to get earned media. Many schools are including regular features on their social channels. George School is a Quaker boarding school near Philadelphia, and they offer a weekend pic pictures feature on their website. Then they use Twitter and Facebook to drive students and families to the weekend pictures page that's updated every week. I also recommend getting creative with contests. This Tuesday trivia is a nice idea from, for alums at Oregon State. Every Tuesday morning at the same time, the Oregon State Alumni Association posts a trivia question on their social channels, and they offer a prize to the winner. And we all know that competition and prizes nearly always encourage audiences to respond and participate. Content that is special, like insider info, will get the attention of people who use social media. And actually, if you provide insider info, you'll often encourage people to start using social, social channels that didn't, didn't think they would. When I, back in 2009, when I was at William & Mary, I directed the communication for William & Mary's search for a new mascot. And we directed, the, we, we, the entire communication effort was mostly a social media campaign. We use social to share some of the mascot ideas we were getting. We use social to let people know that they could vote. We leaked some details about the five possible mascots that we were considering. And as a result, many, many William & Mary alums followed these channels because we were offering insider information. We were offering something that they couldn't get anyplace else. And we, we pretty much customized the channels. There were certain things that we leaked on Facebook versus uh, Twitter. So again, this seems like 
standard stuff now, but back in 2009 it was pretty unusual. Um, and it allowed us to create a lot of enthusiasm and a lot of interest amongst our alumni body about the mascot search. And speaking of alumni, it, it does help uh, when John Stewart is an alum of your school and he mentions your mascot search on The Daily Show. During the William & Mary mascot search, the social media campaign was so effective that we, we did get his attention and he talked about the search on two different occasions uh, on The Daily Show. So featuring your alums, your own famous alums, is a great content idea and it might lead to earned media. I think emotion can also be a very effective content for social. There are plenty of things that happen on schools campuses that your audiences will get sentimental about. And I say go for it and use this kind of content to connect with parents and with alums. They love this stuff. Notice that just the right photo with an emotional caption really works well. This actually was brought home to me just this week. We're, we're working with a, a large university on a social media strategy. And as part of that strategy, we've been talking to parents and alumni and lots of stakeholders at the university. So I've had a chance to do several parent interviews. And more than once, a parent has said to me, yes, I follow the university's social channels. And I don't know whether you'll be surprised to know this, but lots of parents are saying it's a way for me to keep up with what my, my student is doing. Um, I can see events that are going on on campus. I can find out about activities that my student might want to participate in. And of course, you all know we're in this helicopter generation of parents. So parents are using social media to find out what's going on. And they're, of course, emailing their kids or texting their kids and telling them the things that they ought to be taking advantage of on campus. So anyway, parents are very interested in, in institutional social channels. All right, let's move on to round three. I really think that it's time to get out of our own way. And I think we can turn up the volume for exceptional content for social channels. So I'm going to run through some examples that I hope will inspire you to take your social content to the next level. One of the reasons that I, that I'm put, that I put these examples together is I think the best communication efforts are efforts that take a little bit of a risk. Um, it's a calculated risk. It's, it's done in the context of uh, professional planning and expertise about marketing and communications. But in order to distinguish yourself from everyone else out there talking about what happens on their campuses, and frankly, if you've done college tours, you know how similar all of our messages are, um, anything you can do to distinguish yourself and talk a little bit about what's special at your institution is a really powerful thing. So the first suggestion that I have is that we should be a little bit fun or wacky or both. I think we need to take ourselves a little less seriously and highlight the fun on our social platforms. I think people expect us to be more lighthearted, more informal, less serious, less academic. Um, and so this is an opportunity to show a little bit of personality. This is another example that comes from Webster University. This is a Google Plus post, and um, the, the folks, the students at Webster, decided to break the Guinness World Record for the longest ice cream dessert ever. So they built this Sunday on Webster's St. Louis campus using 456 pounds of ice cream. I love it. Um, and then posted about it on Google Plus. And I'm sure, knowing the folks at Webster, Patrick Powers being one of them, they probably repurposed this content for a lot of other channels um, besides Google Plus. And by the way, if Patrick Powers is, is someone you're not following, you really should be. He is um, an exceptional social media expert, as well as somebody who's very knowledgeable about marketing and communications. Um, he writes a great blog. If you're not following it and you do social, you should be. So Twitter and Facebook personas are also fun and wacky for building an audience. Um, every campus has squirrels, right? And they've all got statues and all kinds of mascots. So there has been this proliferation of campus statues that tweet and mascots with Facebook pages. Um, this example is Albus the Squirrel, and he lives on campus at Oberlin College. His chief babysitter is Mayan Plout, who's the social media coordinator for Oberlin. Um, according to Albus's profile, he lacks opposable thumbs. And so he offers many thanks to his human counterpart for her typing skills. So Albus comments on the goings-on at Oberlin. 
Um, he talks about activities. He um, takes pictures. I'm pretty sure he is available not just on Facebook and Twitter, but also on, um, I know I've seen him on Tumblr. I'm not sure about Pinterest. So this is a great idea as a way to engage current students particularly and alums um, about your campus. And make no mistake about, about these personas. They are fun and um, they can sort of communicate in a different way, but they can also be incredibly on message. They can talk a lot about the brand um, platform that you have for your institution. Um, and so it's, it's, it's a great way to, to use social. I also think our social channels can be directed towards town and gown issues. Um, we're all, you know, colleges and universities and schools that are located within a community. And um, likely, uh, there are folks in the community who don't work at the university or college or school or, or who don't attend there, but still follow what's going on on your campus. And so I think we can use our social channels to connect with the broader community and make it clear what our impact is on the world. I think we can connect the dots for the public and help them understand the kinds of things that happen on a college campus, how we contribute to the, gener the, the production of knowledge, how we can contribute to the vitality of a community. Um, this is an example from Fordham University. And there are a couple of posts right here in this one screen graph that I got. Um, one is about um, ticks and, you know, essentially information about being safe, um, you know, and, and guarding yourself against tick bites. And another is about a Fordham summer program that is for high school students in the New York City area. So again, just making a, a connection for the public about sort of the tentacles of the university and how much they reach out into the community. I've mentioned a couple of times that photos always work. And, and so I think we could probably even take this a step further. I think social platforms like Flickr, and, and there's, there's a zillion other ones like it, let you see stats. And so you know what types of photos are popular with your target audiences. You know what gets the most view, views. You know what gets the most comments and feedback. And then I think knowing what your audience likes like certainly helps you select photography for future posting on, on your social channel. But another, a couple of other pluses I see from, from these kinds of photo management tools one is that since something like Flickr can help you determine the most popular photography, why not also use those preferences when you're selecting photos for your website or selecting photos for print pieces? It's kind of a, an informal audience testing that you can, that you can do. Um, one of the things I notice as I work with colleges and universities across the country is that very few people take the time to test a lot of their creative work, and, and I mean visual and editorial work. It's, it's expensive. Um, they feel like they can't afford to do it in a way that, that, that can be done you know, in a sophisticated manner. But there are a lot of things you can do to test your content, and I think social media is one of them. It's a, it's a huge mistake, I think, for um, the wrong target group, the wrong demographic to be making some of the choices that we have to make with photography and content. So anytime that you can use social to get a read on what your audiences prefer or what they respond to, I say use that information. So live tweets, back in the day, this was the point of Twitter, right? I'm sure there's some of you out there, me included, who remember you know, the first time you went to an event and tweeted from the location with a hashtag. I still think there's an opportunity for this because you can create a stream of content about an event that people really care about. So things like graduation are the obvious choice for this. And I've also seen lots of schools tweet from athletic events. And the nice thing about this now, more and more people are using Twitter, um, you can promote your hashtags in advance, prior to commencement, prior to homecoming, and let the crowd provide the content. Let people upload photos to their own social channels using your hashtag and really um, sort of do a, a, create quite a buzz around whatever, it is, whatever event it is that you have going on. So I think social media um, has a really strong connection to mobile. And in fact, about a year ago, I wrote a blog post about this, suggesting that mobile is a social media tool. And at the time I said this, there were a few people who sort of rolled their eyes at me. But in recent months, I think it's become very clear that social content 
and mobile delivery are really tightly connected. So think about a couple of facts. One is people are always on their smartphones, even when they're not mobile. So if I'm at, uh, sitting on my back deck or watching TV, uh, chances are I have my iPad or some sort of a smartphone next to me as a way to, to stay connected. Second fact, people more often than not are using social apps on these mobile devices. Some of you may have heard this recently, but Facebook has announced that 50% um, of its traffic comes from mobile devices. That is huge, 50%. So what is this connection between social and mobile mean for those of us who are responsible for marketing and communications? Well, I think it means that we know where our audiences are. They're on mobile devices, and they're using social media apps, which means that we should continue to explore ways to enhance our content on social media channels and make it more engaging and more useful. Why? Because your followers will instantaneously notice your tweets with news about who's going to speak at commencement, or if, even if they're miles away from campus. And while standing in line at the movie theater, they might click through from your post to read a news item about your latest rankings or to watch one of your videos. It's never been more convenient for your audience to experience your content so you really have to make it count. Uh, on this slide, there are links to a couple of blog posts that I've written recently about um, mobile and social. Another idea that I have for social media is that you ought to watch for things that are said outside of social that you can post on the social channel. So maybe you'll stumble on a few perfect sentences in an email from a parent, or in a phone conversation with an alum, you'll hear them say a wonderful, um, tribute to your university that you could use on a social channel, or maybe you'll just hear the right story from one of your professors. That's great content for social. So the best communication is personal, right? I think we're all selfish creatures when it comes to communication. There is a lot we have to pay attention to, and I pay attention most when you are offering me something that I can't get anyplace else. So if I get something out of your content, I'm more likely to engage with it. More and more social content offers a service or a benefit, and that's what people expect. The days of uh, outbound marketing where we, uh, businesses, you know, market with, with consumers is over. Um, most of what people are experiencing and understanding about brands is coming from inbound marketing. It's coming from social channels and content on websites that people are engaging with when it's convenient for them and when they need a particular service. So in higher ed, this sort of content can be targeted for admission and for connecting with incoming students. So consider this example here of using Facebook for finding a roommate. Um, I'm sure some of you out there have college-age students, and so that you, you know that immediately, either as soon as they're admitted or as soon as they decide to attend a particular school, they're on the Facebook site, either of the school or their own, um, sort of connecting with people who are also going to be going to that school and finding out anything they can in advance. So the takeaway here is if your content offers unique benefits, then people will seek out your channel to get those benefits. As I, as I was putting this slide together, I thought of another classic example, and that is that my mom decided to use Facebook for one reason, and it had nothing to do with social media. Um, she wanted to see the pictures of her grandchildren that she knew my siblings and I were posting on Facebook. She had no interest in social media, she had no interest in Facebook, but she wanted to see the pictures, so she learned how to use it. So speaking of services, here's a question. When are schools going to figure out that alums engage with their alma mater around finding or changing jobs? And maybe we should be investing in useful content on LinkedIn that will lead to better career networks and more alums helping other alums get hired. And that's the kind of alumni engagement that alumni will appreciate. There's, there's, there's several different times that I think alums think about their institutions. Um, one is when your own kids start to, to figure out colleges. You start to reflect on your own experience. Another is, frankly, what I just mentioned, and that is either trying to find a job or changing jobs. And um, one of the things that I've noticed about lots of LinkedIn channels in higher education is that there's more than one. Um, there's usually some sort of organizational chart that you might be able to draw from the LinkedIn uh, 
environment of a particular institution. So maybe there's one that's you know started by the Career Services Office, or maybe there's a LinkedIn group that's part of the Alumni Association, or maybe a particular graduate school has a LinkedIn group. I mean, folks, we have got to get this figured out. We've got to start all working together for the benefit of our alums who are trying to navigate our siloed structures in some of these social media channels to get good service. So um, this is an area where I think we, we have some work to do. Speaking of good questions, I think an obvious way to start a conversation is to ask a question. Seems pretty straightforward. Um, when you meet somebody new, the best way to get to know them is to ask them a question about themselves. And I think Gettysburg has done an interesting thing with their website related to asking a question. Back in late 2011, they um, created a poll on their website that allowed anyone to vote on their favorite Gettysburg College news story from the prior year. And it was a way to sort of connect people with their content, reconnect people who may not have seen it the first time around, and what's going to happen if I'm trying to figure out which you know, news story I want to vote for. Hmm, I'm going to go back and look at all of the news stories, or at least some subset of them, that you've posted on your site. This is um, a screen, a bit of a screen grab, also from from Gettysburg, that shows um, you know what what people would see when they were uh, voting for a particular story. I think you could do this sort of thing on uh, any number of of social channels. All right, so continuing our theme about asking questions to create content on social channels, we are now at the PG-13 portion of this webinar. Um, so I will let you know as a spoiler that there are F-bombs on the next slide. About a year ago, a website created by two Oberlin alums used a question to start a conversation. Um, this site was not part of the official Oberlin communication with um, prospective students or alumni or anyone else, but did anyone see the site called Why the F Word Should I Choose Oberlin? As I said, this site is not officially um, affiliated with Oberlin, but I think it offers a focus on content that is hard to beat. I think it's an incredible message for all of us who use social and web for communication. The first thing I point out to you is that there's very little design on this site. Um, those of you who've worked on web site projects or web communication efforts know that we can spend hours and weeks and months talking about pixels and graphics and, and colors and, and typeface. Um, this site focuses on content. It's what I read there. It's the information that you show me that makes a difference. And there's nothing like just the right compelling question to elicit lots of responses from your audience. And really, as I was re I've been looking at this site and as I refresh it to see the answer each time to the why the F should I choose Oberlin, um, I think this crowdsourced content does an incredible job of describing the Oberlin brand. Now, some of you may be familiar with this site. It created quite a buzz when it launched, um, as I say, it was about a year ago. And Ben Jones, who's the VP for communications at Oberlin, was clear that the site was not endorsed or officially part of Oberlin.edu when he was interviewed. But he was quoted as saying, if you can look past the bad language, it is a wonderful communal love letter to Oberlin. And I think he's right. And by the way, I mentioned Mayan Plout when I showed you the slide of Albus the Squirrel. Mayan writes an excellent um, blog about social media. She's very active on Twitter. And she is also someone that I would suggest you follow if you are um, doing social media for your campus. And she is one of the two alums who created this um, WTF site. It's interesting to me as I, as I, again, as I meet people around the country who work in higher education, how many of our social channels are managed now by, by alums of institutions and by, you know, frankly, people who are um, in their 20s. Um, these, these individuals have grown up using social as a way to communicate. They're very, um, they have a real affinity for it, and they have a flexibility and, a, and a, um, a willingness to shape content in a way that works with social. I also think when you hire an alum for your social media uh, work, you end up sort of jump-starting your social media efforts because you've got someone who knows your institution, knows what it's like to be a student there, and can really bring that to life on your social channel. 
So many schools are using social channels as a way to notify their community about emergencies and closings due to weather. And in my opinion, this sort of content makes perfect sense for social. And I think our audiences, frankly, expect us to use social when we have some sort of emergency or some sort of crisis that we need to, um, you know, hopefully in, in rare circumstances communicate about. But I'll make two comments about, about this use of social. And the first is, um, you might want to remind your senior leadership that these messages are seen by everybody. So not just the people on campus. Social is not an internal only channel. And of course, I, you know, I would not suggest that you not use your social channels if you need to. But as much as you can, I would use them sparingly. Because remember that prospective students and prospective uh, parents are also following these same channels. And the second thing I would say related to emergency or crisis communication and social media is you really ought to decide before an emergency and before a crisis whether or not you use social media to communicate. Um, you don't want to be in a situation where you have to communicate quickly and no one has decided how social is part of that communication plan. So it should be intentional. Um, the other thing to think about is, you know, most colleges and universities have multiple social media channels. So which one is the official channel that, that does the emergency and crisis communications if it's needed? Um, you might also want to, you know, put together some policy around that content so that, you know, the admission office or the athletics office knows that the official channel for emergency and crisis communications might be, you know, your publications, your public affairs office, something like that. All right, let's do a little bit of wrap up. I want to make sure we have plenty of time for some thoughts and questions that all of you might have. Um, I thought we could take a look at just a few do's and don'ts about creating content for social media. Most of these I think you, you all probably will have already seen or already uh, keep in mind, but they sort of summarize um, many of the content ideas that, that I've shared so far. So first, let's go to the do's. Keeping it casual. You know, again, these things seem obvious, but um, just this week I was having a conversation with a client who wanted us to make the language on the web more formal. Um, and really, it's, it's not that kind of medium. People don't expect to read in the same way. They don't expect to see the same kind of copy on, on, on our web presence, and that includes our social channels. Um, I think you should have a plan especially when so many of you have multiple people posting. I mean, what's your plan for retweeting? I mean, what's your plan for sharing content? Um, does athletics, you know, retweet everything that's posted by, you know, admissions? I mean, you know, having some sort of editorial approach to all of these channels is a good idea for managing content. Um, trying new things, adapting to change, these are all things that I think, um, you know, social media does lend itself for experimentation, so I would encourage you to, to feel like you can do some of that. Um, you're going to make some mistakes, um, so I would, you know, let the small stuff go. I mean, it's, it's crazy that um, one of the biggest mistakes that gets called out on social media is, you know, typos and grammar and, you know, minor factual errors. You know, if that happens, own it. You know, just respond as you would if the person was standing in front of you and say, hey, sorry about that. We, we made a mistake. Um, listening is a good thing to do on social channels and interacting with the people that are following you. Asking questions, as I've already mentioned, is um, a great way to start a conversation. Here are a few don'ts, and I think if you avoid these, you'll probably be producing some compelling social content. Um, you know, things are changing in the social world, even though it still seems new to many of us. Um, the more obvious promotion that we all do on our so social channels is, um, is something that we probably should do a little less of, and maybe participate in the conversation and not view our channels as, as just sort of one-way marketing um, megaphones. You know, I've read blog posts where people are sort of asserting that marketers are ruining social. So I think those of us who do marketing and communications will have to be careful about our own use of these channels and, and keeping them as they're intended to be. Um, silence is, you know, doesn't work real, real well on social. Um, it, it's shocking to me how many Facebook pages or Twitter feeds you can go to where the last post or the last tweet was, you know, last August when students were about to move back to campus. These things are easy to start. Um, 
putting together content, if you've been responsible for it, takes a lot longer than you think it's going to. So make sure that you have a plan for content and aren't finding yourself silent for months and months at a time. We've already talked about being a little bit less formal. Um, your post should vary. I mean, different kinds of content, different kinds of questions, different kinds of information that you want your channel, your followers to see. Um, I have a personal thing about linking Facebook and Twitter. I think it worked back in the day when we could assume that certain people were on Facebook and certain people were on Twitter and there wasn't much of a connection. Um, I think now these things should be managed separate, separately. And you can certainly use the same themes, messages, content, but you need to repurpose it for each channel and not just post the same thing auto, automatically in both, in both, both places. Um, responding to trolls is another don't. Um, trolls, in case you don't know about them, are people who kind of hang out on the internet trying to start things up. So they might post something outlandish on your um, social channel or ask a question that, you know, points to some, you know, perceived inadequacy about your institution. Um, to avoid that kind of responding to those kinds of things is a good idea, particularly if you have a community that will respond on your behalf. So you probably are going to want to learn more. We've talked about a lot of ideas. We've talked about a lot of recommendations and possibilities. But there are a couple of resources that I want to call out to you that I think are great for social media. The first is the, um, the CASE blog. Um, many of you are probably members of CASE, the institutional um, members of CASE. And they started a blog, oh gosh, I'm thinking at least two years ago. But anyways, it's particularly focused on social media. Um, the people who post on this blog are people who work in higher education throughout the US. Um, a couple of the people that I've already called out, um, Maya Plout and um, Patrick Powers post here. Um, Matt Herrick from Northwestern is another person who, who posts great content about social. So I would recommend the, the case blog to you as a place to get all kinds of ideas and case studies about things that people are doing and, and how successful they are. Um, the other thing about CASE is that they um, sponsor an annual social media conference. Um, the third conference was this past year, and so the fourth one will be upcoming in April 2013. It's going to be in Cambridge, Mass this year, and um, I chaired this conference last year. It was an incredible opportunity for people who do social media. Um, it's pretty much a three, you know, two and a half day conference all around social. So I would highly recommend it to any of you who are thinking about um, attending a conference in the coming year. Another way to get ideas for social content is to visit ED Universe. I hope some of you are already members of ED Universe. Um, ED Universe is a new network that's sponsored by M. Stoner. We um, celebrated our 10th year in business um, back in November. And as a gift to the higher education community, we built and launched this site at eduniverse.org. And it's essentially a way to share content with other people who do marketing and communications within education. So anybody can create a profile. Um, and you can either post content or just look at the content other people post. In fact, I'm pretty sure you can look at content without even creating a profile. But I call it out to you because there are currently more than 500 people who work in, in communications and marketing and education who've created profiles on this site. And there are over a 1,000 posts. Um, and again, we just we just launched this site at the end of February. So um, a lot of the posts that you'll see on ED Universe do focus on social media. So I would recommend um, checking that out. All right, we have reached the end of my formal presentation, and my guest is Mallory has been very busy responding to the back channel and um, hearing from some of you about um, some of your thoughts and questions. So Mallory, do we have any questions from the group? Oh, do we ever. So we have tons of questions. And this back channel has probably been the most active one that we have had at any of our webinars this year. So that's awesome. And um, you know, we're just so appreciative of everyone who's joining us today and participating. There's a lot of really great discussion going on back there. So let's start uh, with a few questions from Twitter. Um, so Gia asks, Susan, what are some good ways to showcase user-generated content beyond social media shares and retweets? Hmm, okay. User-generated. 
I am. Um, people have varying opinions about this, but I'm a big believer in showcasing um, photography that you get from, frankly, non-professionals. Um, who are members of your community. So I think it's a great idea to take a photo from, you know, outside your campus and make it the main feature photo on your homepage. Um, I, I know that in many of the schools that I visited and, and, and been involved with, um, there are people who use student photography in print publications. Um, so I think that's a great a great way to, to showcase some of that user generated content. I think websites do that. I think blogs do that in a really in a really great way. You know, I know, you know, sometimes people forget about blogs and they don't necessarily think of them as social anymore. And they do require a commitment. And as somebody who tries to maintain a personal one, I I don't underestimate the time commitment that's required. But blogs are incredibly effective and a great way to um, share content that you're that you're finding. I also think. Um, I don't know. I, I I would need to think a little bit more about this, but I think there's a lot of opportunity for um, tools like Tumblr and Pinterest as a way to. It, it, there's just this bulletin board aspect of them that seems to fit user-generated content for me. And another tool um, would be Storify, which one of our attendees mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. actually suggested yep. as well. So. Um, Storify, yes. if people are familiar with it, allows you to um, turn turn tweets into a timeline and, and create you know a story out of them. So that that would be another really great tool to add as well. Yes. All right, let's move on to the next question um, because we do have a few. Uh, so Katie has asked, do you think it is possible to get too stuck in an academic calendar? How fresh? or good of a memory do you think our audience actually has? Yeah. You know, it's it's yeah, part of the problem is, you know, it's the same it's, it's the same problem that you have with your college and university website where you have this incredibly diverse audience. Um, you've got this huge internal audience, you've got this huge external audience, and then both of those can be subdivided into a whole bunch of, you know, more pieces of the pie. Um, I understand that I think you can get too stuck, and I think you can, you know, everybody knows you're doing homecoming and everybody knows you're doing commencement. So anytime you can you can bring out something unique to your campus, I think it's a good idea. That said, people are tried and true about things that they remember and things that they want to connect with each other about. And there are certain things that happen on our, our campuses that are everyone's experience. Um, so you can count on everyone having been a part of that. Um, so yeah, I mean, it's just it's just like anything. Too much of a good thing can always turn into a negative. Um, I just think that we should take into account the seasons of our campus and sort of the the flow of what's going on and try to make that come to life on social because I think it makes people feel like they're there even if they're not. All right, next. Question. Uh, as social media managers, how can we balance a bold and clever while maintaining institutional brand and voice? And this was something that the back channel was discussing a little bit during the webinar. Say that again, Mallory. So, uh, so tone sure. and voice. Yeah, how, how can we as social media managers, you know, it's, it's a tricky thing balancing how fun and wacky we are on social channels. So how can we balance that, you know, boldness and clever, um, you know, style but still maintain the institutional brand and voice? Yeah, I mean, I think that that in some ways depends, I'm going to sound like a consultant now, um, that in some ways depends on your institution. I mean, if you're... You know, if you're, we're working with a, a client right now who has this incredible affinity between alumni and prospective students and the university, and what they all tell you is that it's a family. There's this passion, there's this like love of the university that's frankly unlike any that I've ever seen. So you have to know what what is the brand of, of that institution. And if that's part of your brand, then you can't go wrong if you do things that are emotional or passionate or caring about other individuals. Um, so I don't know that you really need to balance. You know, I don't, I don't know that you need to say, OK, here's my brand. I'm going to do that today. And tomorrow, I'm going to be fun and wacky. If fun and wacky just doesn't fit with your brand ever, then first, I'm sorry for you. But second, don't use it. 
um, you know, I think you need to know what it is, what's the tone and voice that you use on any of your print pieces, on your website, on the messages that your president sends, on the speeches that your um, alumni association president gives, etc., and try to make that come to life in your social channels. Okay, great advice, Susan. I just want to remind everybody before we move on to the next question that as, as you leave the webinar today, we do have a very short survey after you log out. And so that really helps us plan for the rest of the year what webinars we're going to do and what type of content you're looking for and what you thought of today. So I just want that to throw out that quick reminder that we really appreciate it if you take the three minutes to just fill that survey out. All right, let's move on to the next question. Um, so David asks, do you have any suggestions for the sequence or frequency of content on multiple channels? So for example, um, should you have Facebook and Twitter posts on the same day about the same topic? Which should come first? How often should you be posting on one versus the other, et cetera? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, I, I would have to refresh myself on some of the recommendations that are made from these various fairly sophisticated algorithms on a lot of these social channels. But, you know, I can recall a time when I felt badly that I was posting on these channels at the same time every day because I thought, okay, that's not being sort of, you know, um, spontaneous enough. But come to find out, posting on channels regularly at the same time is a great way to make sure that your content is forefront um, for um, the various algorithms that, that determine, uh, especially in Facebook, how that content is presented on news feeds. Um, as far as the volume of content, I think regular posts make sense. Um, and for most social channels, and I think for most of the, certainly if you think about the own, you, the, you know, the, the brands that you follow, um, I expect to hear from those channels at least every day. Um, maybe I could hear from them three or four times a week and be okay with that. Um, I do think you can post too much. So, you know, I would, I would think two or three posts a day on Twitter and two or three posts a day on Facebook wouldn't be too many. Um, whereas a lot of the channels now, like Pinterest or Tumblr, they're sort of built for multiple posting. There's this expectation that there's going to be this, you know, wealth of stuff there and they don't have the same kinds of constraints. Um, in terms of blogs, you know, it's really funny how it works. Um, the best way to get people to follow your blog, believe it or not, is to write blog posts. Um, it seems crazy, but it is true. People will follow your blog if you post regularly there. Thanks, Susan. All right, our last question that we're going to answer live um, is coming up, and if we did not get to your questions, we will absolutely follow up on the M. Stoner blog with an answer soon. Um, so today's last question, Susan, how can you repurpose content from your website as content for social media? Um, I think the best strategy to use there is to think, um, to have a, essentially to have a marketing and communication strategy that is story first and channel second. So you ought to be meeting regularly um, from the standpoint, here's, you know, here's where we can learn something from newspapers. You know, Every day, somebody needs to think about the story. What is it that we want to promote today? And that's an editorial function, and it's something that should be a high-level function on your campus, and it should involve many, many people who communicate on your behalf. Um, so I think on a regular basis, somebody needs to be thinking about what the messages are, what the stories are, what the brand platform is, and then figuring out what channel is appropriate. So is the right channel for this print? Is the right channel for this print and web? And if it's print and web, which part is print and which part is web? Um, I'm not sure that I'm, that I'm specifically answering the question, so let me try to get a little bit more concrete about that. Um, I. I actually am a big believer when you put together a, a communications plan or a campaign around a particular topic that you actually create a spreadsheet and you have a column for Facebook and you have a column for Twitter and you have a column for um, you know your blog and you write down 
your ideas about how that particular piece of content is phrased for Facebook or how that particular piece of content is phrased for Twitter. And is there a photography that goes with that? Is there a blog that goes with that? What's the right timing for that particular post? So those are all things that I think I would think about as you're, as you're repurposing content. Um, I think you want to drive people back to your website. So it's okay to have most of your content be on a web page and then you're sort of teeing that up with social media and doing perhaps just a teaser to, to send people back to one location. Um, so I don't think your, your socials have to do you know, all the heavy lifting. Um, but you're right that there's, there's, this, there's this exercise that has to happen where you think about the story and then what's the best way to slice and dice that story for the various channels. Well, thanks so much, Susan, for presenting this awesome webinar. Someone on Twitter actually just said that this is the most helpful webinar that they've experienced in a really long time. So that's some serious oh, kudos well, that's, to you. Well, that's, and, that's very nice to hear. That made my day. Thank you, whoever said that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I also, of course, want to thank everyone for attending the webinar. Um, if we didn't get to your question during the live session, it will be responded to on the M. Stoner blog uh, either tomorrow or Monday. Um, so please, you know, I've already mentioned this, but please take a very short survey after you log out. And just so you know, thank you for the 63 of you who stuck around this long. The next webinar will be on responsive design, and that will be on September 19th. So sign-up information is going to come out on the M. Stoner blog in a few weeks, so stay tuned. And uh, like I said, mark your calendar, September 19th, our next webinar is on responsive design. All right, thanks everyone. Enjoy the rest of your day, and I hope uh, you all have a great next couple of weeks as students start returning to your campus, all right? So thanks so much, and we'll see you next time. Bye-bye.